Niels Bohr comes along, thinks he can refine that model of the atom, the planetary model of the atom. Niels Bohr looks at what Rutherford found and says, yeah, you know what? I agree with the fact that there's a small, dense, positive nucleus there. Yeah, I can live with that. The fact that uh, most of the atom is empty space, sure, I can live with that too. Electrons orbit around the nucleus, yeah. So what makes the Bohr model of the atom different from the planetary model of the atom? If all of those observations and that uh, Rutherford made, Bohr accepts. Yep. The electrons, you mean? Yeah. Good. Well, yeah, you know what, actually? Almost the opposite, actually. But you're on the right track, for sure. Um, the electrons can't just go anywhere they want. Rutherford said the electrons have to orbit around the nucleus in a circle, wherever they want. Bohr said that the electrons have to orbit around the nucleus on specific levels. So he acknowledged the existence of electron levels. If you've taken chemistry, you know that electrons can exist on the first level, the second level, whatever. There's two electrons, max two on the first level. I think it's max eight on the second level, and so on and so on. You don't need to remember those numbers. I don't remember those numbers past the second or third one. Don't worry about that. You just, you just have to know that they're on electron, they're on their own level. And each level is characterized by a specific energy. So the energy of the electron on the first level is different than the energy of the electron on the third level. The second observation, we call it stationary states. Electrons, as they orbit around the nucleus, watch my keys as I swing around my head here. Electrons, as they orbit around the nucleus, go in a circle. Whether they're on levels or not, they go in a circle. As they go in a circle, they experience a centripetal acceleration. According to Maxwell, a centripetal acceleration or any acceleration of a charged particle should generate EMR. But it didn't. We know that it didn't because if these electrons experience a centripetal acceleration and emitted EMR, if they accelerate toward the center and emit EMR, then they would lose energy. And as they lost energy, they would spiral into the nucleus, just like my keys just did. That doesn't happen. So it's as if they're not accelerating. It's as if they're not even moving. It's as if they're stationary. It's as if they're in a stationary state. Finally, the third aspect of the Bohr model of the atom that differentiated it from Rutherford's planetary model of the atom talks about electron transitions. Electrons can jump to a higher level. You go to the saddle for a hockey game, and your seats are up there at the row 20 of the sport check zone. You got to go up to a higher level. What do you better make sure you've done? Make sure you've had supper. Make sure you've had pasta the night before. Make sure you've just had a coffee with some caffeine to give you some energy. You need to absorb some energy to get to that higher level. Usually that energy in the atom would be EMR, but not necessarily. Any form of energy, including from another electron striking it cause the electrons to jump to a higher level. But if I'm in the third deck and I see two seats open down there in the first deck, what am I going to do? I'm going to move down. If there's a vacancy, electrons will fall to a lower level. What do you think they do when they fall to a lower level? They lose energy or they emit energy. And that energy will be, not usually, but it always will be in the form of EMR. First day of our last unit, we talked about how different types of EMR were produced. Remember, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet were all produced by 
transitions of electrons in the atom from higher to lower levels. Here we go. This is going to describe for us um, a, in a little bit more detail what's happening with these electron transitions, that third aspect of the Bohr model of the atom. What I'd like you to do right now is draw a line between the first diagram and the second diagram. That first diagram is going to represent a reference diagram for us. It doesn't really have anything to do with the Bohr model of the atom per se. We're just going to use it to reference the last two diagrams, which do have something to do with the Bohr model of the atom and electron transitions. We're going to number this one, diagram number one, diagram number two, and diagram number three. Let's describe our reference diagram first, or our non-Bohr diagram first. In this one, you can see that we have a light bulb, an old-style incandescent light bulb, or some other heated solid, or heated liquid, or heated gas under high pressure. When you have one of these substances, a heated solid, a heated liquid, or a heated gas under high pressure, it will produce electromagnetic radiation. In fact, it'll produce what we call a continuous spectrum. That's all the colors of the rainbow. And not like distinct red and distinct orange, but red transitioning into orange. It's a rainbow, right? You see the continuous spectrum there. But not when you look at the light bulb or the glowing solid. When you look at the glowing solid, it appears to be white light. So in order to see the rainbow or the spectrum that's produced, you actually have to put something in between your screen and your producer. And that would be either a diffraction grating or a prism, not both. The prism and diffraction grating split it up so that it looks more or less the same, the pattern that is, except that the prism would be Roy G. Viv, the diffraction grating would be Viv G. Or, right? The opposite to that, right? But it's the same effect, essentially, just backwards, that's all. Continuous spectrum, okay? White light separated into its colors, polychromatic light separated into its colors produces this continuous spectrum, this rainbow. It's what you see when you look up in the sky when it's raining. Okay, let's move to the second diagram, which does have more to do directly with the Bohr model of the atom. In the second diagram, you notice our source of EMR here is not a hot solid or a hot liquid or a hot gas under high pressure. Rather, it's a hot gas under low pressure. That produces EMR as well, but it doesn't produce all types of EMR. It's not a continuous spectrum like we have in the top diagram, diagram number one. Rather, it produces only specific colors of light. Each of those colors would correspond to a specific transition that was taking place. So we might get a transition taking place within this hot gas from level five to level three. That would emit a photon, a certain color photon. We might get another transition taking place from level four to level one. That would produce a different photon or a different frequency, a different color. What you see on this diagram, this emission spectrum, or sometimes we call it a line emission spectrum, are those colors that correspond to the specific transitions that have taken place. It is not a continuous spectrum because you don't get all colors. All you're getting is a red and an orangish yellowish, and then a yellowish green, and a green, and a blue, and an indigo, and a violet, corresponding to unique, specific transitions that have taken place. Line emission, because electrons have gone from high level to low level, producing lines, specific photons. OK, now let's fast forward to the last diagram, the third one where we have pretty much the same thing as the first diagram. In fact, if we scratch out that cold gas, we have exactly the same thing as the first diagram. Don't scratch it out on your diagram yet, though. Look, we've got our hot solid or liquid or gas under high pressure. Whatever it is, it's producing this EMR here. It's producing uh, white light or polychromatic light. And when we put that polychromatic light through a prism or a diffraction grating, it produces our spectrum. What kind of spectrum does it produce? Continuous spectrum. It's not the Bohr model of the atom here. We're not talking about electron transitions. We're just talking about our reference diagram. 
But watch what happens when I introduce the cold gas. We get a slightly different absorption spectrum in diagram three once I introduce the cold gas than we got from the first diagram. What's different about it? Yeah, there's no black lines in the continuous spectrum. There's black lines in this absorption spectrum. What do you think those black lines correspond to? Good. Um, well, specifically, the transitions that take place within the cold gas. You just noticed, Caitlin just noticed that they happen to be the same transitions that took place in the hot gas, and we'll revisit that in just a second, okay? Um, but the bottom line is you have a continuous spectrum produced by this hot solid liquid or gas under high pressure minus certain colors that seem to have been taken away, right? There's all this light minus colors that have been taken away. What were they taken away by? The cold gas. The cold gas absorbed photons, causing electrons to jump to higher levels. Remember we said a few minutes ago, electrons can fall and they give off EMR. Electrons can jump and they absorb energy, usually in the form of EMR. These black lines correspond to the missing photons, the photons that were taken away by the cold gas. Now, Caitlin also noticed that those photons or those lines are in the exact same positions and therefore the exact same frequency and wavelength as the lines produced in the emission spectrum. What do you know about this hot gas and this cold gas based on what Caitlin just noticed, right? It's the same gas. Every element or compound produces a unique spectrum. So everyone is going to be different. I don't know what this hot gas is or this cold gas is, but I do know that because the spectrum for this hot gas is unique, and I got the same one for this cold gas, just in reverse because it's an absorption spectrum, I know it's the same gas. I had a professor in university, his whole academic life besides teaching was photographing atomic spectra. And I remember I never did this stuff in high school. So when I went to university and saw that he did this, I remember thinking like, why? Like you spent 40 years photographing atomic spectra, different transitions of electrons that are taking place in atoms. Without knowing anything about it, it seemed like it was a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Trivial, tedious, um, almost seemed like a waste of time. But he explained to me one day why he was doing this. And it makes perfect sense to me now that I've actually learned about this stuff, right? And hopefully it will to you guys today. He would photograph them and then publish them in journals, in professional journals, these photographs. And then people, physicists, astronomers, would read these professional journals and they'd say, hey, hey, well, that's a neat spectrum, whatever. But it goes beyond just looking at a spectrum and saying, hey, that's a neat spectrum. Um, let's say Kobe is a, an astronomer and he's looking at the night sky and he, he sees a star and it's not on a map anywhere. Nobody's ever noticed a star before. Nobody's ever discovered it before. So he's just discovered a star that nobody's ever seen before. And that happens. Still, that happens. Sometimes it even happens by young people. Like I've heard stories of kids 10, 11 years old discovering a star that nobody's ever discovered before. Kobe wants to find out what that star is made out of. So he looks through a spectrometer, which is basically a prism or diffraction grating, and he looks at the spectrum being produced by this star, this star that is made up of a hot gas. And he compares that spectrum against the known spectra or the spectra that were photographed by my professor or by somebody else, because he wasn't the only person doing this stuff, right? And compares it knowing that the spectrum of hydrogen and helium and whatever is unique, he's able to compare that spectrum and determine the composition of that star simply by looking at the spectrum that's produced from the light or from the transitions of electrons, I should say. Make sense? Take a look at the second diagram on your page. It's this one up here. This gives us three reference spectra, not in color. This was a question that appeared on an exam almost 20 years ago, back before they used color. They still don't use very much color, but if you get a diagram like this now, it would probably appear in color. You can see that you have multiple lines 
in, he, in hydrogen and in helium and in sodium as well, each corresponding to a different transition of an electron from a high level to a low level in that atom. These are photographed by my professor or by somebody else that does the same kind of work. But then Kobe looks at the star and sees an unknown gas mixture spectrum. Doesn't know what's in it. So he wants to determine what's in it. He opens up the little atlas of atomic spectra, pictures, and he looks at the pictures and he says, oh, wait a second. Every single line of hydrogen, every single line of the hydrogen spectrum is in this unknown gas mixture. Therefore, this star must be made at least partially of hydrogen. He's just determined the partial composition of this star. Is there anything else in the unknown gas mixture? We know there's something else, right? Because we've, we've accounted for this line and this line and this line and this line. That's from the hydrogen gas spectrum. Let's just check helium for a second, okay? I know that Nick said it's sodium, but let's just double check helium here. Helium has this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Um, this one's there, right there, corresponds to one of the ones from hydrogen. But none of the rest of them are there. So is, hydrogen, is helium there? No. We know there's hydrogen, but we know there's not helium. Let's keep going. Sodium. There's only two lines in the visible spectrum for sodium. Are they in the unknown gas mixture? Yep. So what does that tell us about the composition of the unknown gas mixture? It's hydrogen and sodium. Make sense? Okay, we'll spend some time tomorrow talking about more details of the Bohr model of the atom, but that's good enough for today.
But the first diagram is going to look like this. That has two diagrams on 